Washington, D.C. has its annual Cherry Blossom Festival, which runs through the 14th. Similar colors can be seen this time of year in China, which held its Qingming Festival late last week. Scores of tourists gathered at gardens to gaze upon a multicolored Monet-like palette of natural beauty. One tourist observed that strolling through this sea of flowers doesn't just make people feel relaxed, it gives them vitality and hope. No coincidence, it's part of a celebration of spring. Qingming means clear and bright. The nation's government-controlled media report that almost 300 million people traveled last Thursday alone to celebrate the festival. It's a time when Chinese pay tribute to their ancestors and typically welcome warmer weather. Hi, I'm Carl Azus. Weather could impact many Americans planning to watch today's total solar eclipse. We have back-to-back -back reports on that and the science behind it coming up on The World From A to Z. First though, a rare earthquake struck the U.S. state of New Jersey last Friday morning. It was measured at magnitude 4.8, which is considered moderate. People can feel it, it's strong enough to shake pictures off walls and dishes out of the cabinet, but no major damage or injuries were reported. One thing that made it unique was the number of people it rattled. At 50 miles from New York City, it shook up an estimated 23 million. Folks from Washington, D.C. to New England said they could feel the tremor. Another thing, quakes are rare in this part of the world. The U.S. government says it's the strongest to hit New Jersey in more than 240 years. There were aftershocks, the strongest measuring 4.0 on Friday afternoon. Another relatively rare event takes place in America this afternoon, a total solar eclipse when the moon blocks out the light of the sun. The dramatic celestial show will happen Monday afternoon through Mexico, the U.S., and Canada when the moon is directly in front of the sun, creating the solar eclipse. It'll be night, birds will chirp, crickets will crick, uh, and generally there's a little bit of a breeze created by the cool air next to the warm air, and it's, it's fantastic. It's been almost seven years since a total solar eclipse arced over the United States, and this year it will be visible to 32 million people in the U.S. But don't worry if you're not in the path of totality. That's because 99% of the people in the U.S. will be able to glimpse at least a partial solar eclipse. And if you plan to be one of those people gazing up at the sky, don't forget to protect your eyes with specially made eclipse glasses. These are eclipse glasses. You can look straight at the sun with them. Even though they're paper and mylar plastic, they are about 100,000 times darker than sunglasses. Some eclipse watchers will have to watch out for something else, the weather. Clouds and storms could hinder the ability to see the eclipse in its full glory in several spots along the path of totality. One of the issues is that it looks like the weather in the southern half of the United States is not going to be great that day. And if you can't watch this year's total solar eclipse, you'll have to wait 20 years for the next one in the contiguous United States. I'm Rob Kirkpatrick reporting. As millions watch the moon block out the sun, scientists across the globe will be keeping a close watch too. This eclipse allowing researchers to study the outer edges of the sun in a way they normally can't. If you talk to the science community about this, they call the moon the perfect coronagraph because it blocks out most of the sun in just a way that allows us to look at the corona. That's the outer atmosphere of the sun, a place scientists still have many questions about. It's where solar winds and storms come from, which when aimed at Earth can affect our upper atmosphere. Sometimes in great ways like the northern lights and sometimes in not so great ways like disrupting communications. NASA will be using sounding rockets and high altitude planes to try and better understand this solar activity. In the past, GPS, electrical grids, satellites and more have been impacted by solar storms. The sun's activity is ramping up. Peter Becker, a George Mason University professor, is working with the Navy and Department of Defense to better understand how solar activities impact systems on Earth, including the Internet. He says a lot of infrastructure needs to be improved to prevent what he calls an Internet apocalypse. If you take the Internet down, even for a day, I think the estimates are like about $10 billion of economic damage per day in the U.S. alone. I'm Michael Yoshida reporting. On this date in world history. Batter up, y'all. Baseball's back for a brand new season, and two big milestones occurred on this date. 
On April 8, 1974, Hank Aaron became Major League Baseball's home run king. He hit his 715th career homer into the left field stands at Atlanta's Fulton County Stadium. He moved past Babe Ruth, who'd held the record for 39 years. Aaron would finish his career with 755 home runs. On this date in 1975, Frank Robinson became the first African-American manager in MLB history. The 39-year-old also played that day for the Cleveland Indians and hit his 575th career home run. Frank Robinson and Hank Aaron went into baseball's Hall of Fame together in 1982. And space history was made on April 8, 1993, when Ellen Ochoa became the first Hispanic woman to go there. Ochoa ultimately completed four missions as an astronaut and went on to become the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center from 2013 to 2018. Get your passport ready for today's World of Viewers segment. We're starting in Chandler, Arizona, where it's great to see Mr. Vollmer's class at Willis Junior High School. Now, depending on where you live, that might not seem too far, but our next stop is more than 10,000 miles away in the Southeast African nation of Mozambique. Welcome to Mrs. Montaner's class at Christian Academy Mozambique in the city of Matola. Up world and out. In terms of wind speed, when it made landfall, what was the strongest hurricane to strike the US? Galveston hurricane? Labor Day Hurricane, Camille, Katrina. Hurricanes weren't given names until 1950, which is why the one with the 185 mile per hour winds was known simply as the Labor Day Hurricane of 1935. Our boardwalk is nearly 100% completed. Our town in general is looking beautiful. 100% complete a great number for Seaside Heights, New Jersey. This was last fall, more than 10 years after Hurricane Sandy decimated huge portions of the northeastern U.S. coast, causing nearly $82 billion in damage. It took me about three years to rebuild my house. But now, homeowners and businesses like this by the millions along the eastern seaboard could be staring down a potentially monstrous hurricane season this summer. Colorado State University's annual hurricane season forecast for 2024 predicts 23 named storms in all. 11 of those, they estimate, could become hurricanes, with possibly five of those clocking in as Category 3 or higher, considered major. To put it in perspective, the average Atlantic hurricane season brings 14 named storms, with seven becoming hurricanes, three of them major. NOAA's Climate Prediction Center points to the natural atmospheric condition of La Nina possibly being in play this year, putting it at a 55 to 77 percent chance between June and November. If so, meteorologists say La Nina will push the jet stream further north, decreasing wind shear, which ripens conditions for more storms to form. Colorado State will release updates to their hurricane season forecast in June, July, and August. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. Keep in mind, that's one early forecast from one of the organizations that makes these predictions. A meteorologist with WBRZ, an ABC affiliate in Louisiana, says Colorado State's early forecast is accurate about 60% of the time. As you heard, it can be updated or revised in the months ahead, and the organization's predictions typically get more accurate as we get into hurricane season. That officially begins on June 1st and runs through November 30th, though these large storms can form at any time. If you're not really into video games and think they're mostly for the birds, well, you might be right. A recent study that examined how birds interact with touchscreens found that, well, they do. Authors say most of the birds seem to enjoy the games they played, though some got mad, attacked the computer, and gave up on the game, just like people. Researchers think these findings can be used to develop new apps and games for birds. I mean, who wouldn't want to play Minecraft? They might tweet about classics like Street Flighter, Final Fantail, Castle Vanga, Super Marigold Brothers, or World of Warblers, or maybe screech over something modern like Fort Nightingale or Timeless like Mario Cardinal. And you know bird gamers will flock to make a purchase with anything featuring Tony Hawk. I'm Carl Azuz, and we hope you'll fly with us again tomorrow on The World from A to Z.